Go, go to Romans 13 if you can. Rome to Romans. Thank you, Joe. Chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, really is all about submission to governing authorities and authorities in our life and how we respond to them. There's one verse that I want to excerpt out of it, two parts of it. It's verse 7. As we teach this morning on the subject, honor to whom honor is due, it says this. It says, give, uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, give to everyone what you owe them. That's the first part, part A. It says, if you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. This last phrase is what I want to hone in on. If honor, then honor. If honor, then honor. Give to everyone what you owe them. If honor, then honor. The Greek word for honor is tamao, and it means to have in honor, to revere, to venerate. Ladies, we're here to honor you. Amen. All women. That's right. We're here to honor you and respect you. Anna M. Jarvis lived from 1864 to 1948. She's the first one suggesting the national observance of an annual day honoring all mothers because she loved her own mother so dearly. At a memorial service for her mother on May 10th, 1908, Miss Jarvis gave a carnation, her mother's favorite flower, to each person who attended. Within the next few years, the idea of the day to honor mothers gained popularity. And Mother's Day was observed in a number of large cities in the U.S. on May 9, 1914, by an act of Congress. President Woodrow Wilson proclaimed the second Sunday in May as Mother's Day. He established the day as a time for public expression of our love and reverence for the mothers of our country. By then, it had become customary to wear white carnations to honor departed mothers and red to honor the living, a custom that continues to this day. So ladies, when you leave today, be sure to get your red carnation on your way out. We're not going to give you a white one. We're going to give you a red one because you're still living. So we just want to honor you and bless you. Three things that I want to talk about regarding mothers. The first is this. Let's just point number one, mother. Mother is the female parent of a household. The figurative meaning of mother also included ancestry. The Bible says in the book of Genesis 3.20, Eve was the mother of all living. I mean, you know, we're sitting here today because of Eve. Did you know that? Every guy, I'm going to tell you, it doesn't matter how macho you are, you were born from a mother. You didn't get here on your own. It took a mama to deliver you. And if you think you're pretty tough stuff, I'd like to try to see you go through a delivery process. <laughs> if you've ever been around it, you know moms, that's a, quite a deal. As I was thinking about this in ancestry and our point and process and all of that, it reminds me of a four-year-old and a six-year-old who presented their mom with a house plant. They'd use their own money, and they were so thrilled and excited that when they brought this plant to their mother, the older of them said with a sad face, there was a bouquet that we wanted to give you at the flower shop. It was real pretty, but it was too expensive. It had a ribbon on it that said, rest in peace. <laughs> and we thought that it would be just perfect since you're always asking for a little peace so that you can rest. I don't really think that's probably what she had in mind. Everybody sitting here has mothers, and as I think about my own mother, I think about the years that I had with her growing up, and like, you know, many of you, you live at different times in your life, so um, born, left when I was uh, 18, came to college, and pretty much been out of the household ever since then. But I think of my mom and different significant point in time in her life, in my life, in my relationship with her. And uh, my mom, interestingly enough, um, she, was, she was born in South Dakota. She did not really know her mom that well because when, her mom was, when my mom was six years old, her mom died. At that point in time, my mom and her sister were sent to a boarding school. And I don't know if any of you know this, but I'm almost one quarter Native American. Did you know that? Here's my pedigree. Half Mexican. I'm a quarter German, little plus and almost a quarter Native American. My mom was raised on the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota. They sent her to the 
boarding school. And if any of you know anything about boarding school and stuff like that, it's really not a pleasant place to be a part of. She's raised in that environment. By the time she was 16, my mom married my dad. Somewhere along the line, they met, got together, and my dad was 21. She was 16. I think he robbed the cradle, if you ask me. But what am I going to say? She was 16. By the time my mom was 17, my sister was born. By the time she was 19, I was born. By the time Tom was born, she was 22. By the time Brian, my brother, was born, she was 23, and then done. Praise God. I wasn't even 22 until I got married. Helen and I were reminiscing yesterday, and uh, we got up, and I didn't, no, I won't brag on myself, that's, that's not good. But what we did is we, she actually worked yesterday around the house and all kinds of stuff, and I was here, and other things were going on, and I came and got her, I says, well, what do you want to do? She says, let's go get a sandwich like Subway or something like that and go out to Fern Ridge. So I said, Okay. So we jumped in the pickup, and we went to Subway. We got a sandwich. We drove out there, got out to the lake, and we parked to the spot where we were, I'll just say it, 40 years before in May. We were 18-year-old kids, so you'll do the math, and then you'll know how old we are. And it was there with some friends. We would sunbathe, like right now in the month of May, in our college, first year of college. And it was there we hung out. We sat there. We ate our Subway sandwiches. We looked at the lake. We parked by a tree exactly where it was all at. In fact, I took a picture. I texted it to my friend who was one of the guys that was there with us during that time frame. Then I all pulled out my phone. I punched in our song. If you're wondering what our song is, that we used to listen to top volume on the way to the lake and on the way back was a song called It's Magic by Pilot. In fact, now you'll hear it on a jingle on TV. That's how mild it is. So we, I cranked it up, and I played it for her. A great big smile came on her face. I said, yeah, I did good here. <laughs> then she says, I want you to play it again as we're going home on the road. So we drove back home, and we went on the road playing its magic as top volume as my phone would go. Awesome. Yeah. But moms, all of you have different things. So like I said, we were 22, and we got married. And then my wife said, everybody had asked her. Why aren't you going to have kids? Why don't you guys have kids? She says, when he's raised, then we'll have kids. It only took seven years to get the job done, and then we finally had our first child, John Mark. But my mom was 23. She was done raising kids. And then, of course, my mom is a very strong woman. She's done having kids at 23. Not raising them, having them. Thank you for correcting me. So time progressed as we progressed. Uh, I'm really a lot more like my mom than my dad. There are certain characteristics of my dad that I carry, but a lot like my mom. My mom's strong. She doesn't put up nonsense. If somebody cuts in line, she says, hey, that person was already there before you. You're behind them. <laughs> yeah, she just, that's, and so I pick that up. It's on me. I don't like injustices. If somebody's doing something wrong, I'll say, hey, what are you doing? I love my mom. She went to be with Jesus when she was 47. I think I was like 20 nine, something like that. So she's in heaven. I look forward to her, and we have a reunion one day. So praise God. But moms are important. Go with me to the book of Jude, Judges, excuse me, Judges chapter 5. I'm going to show you another mother. And by the way, do you know you, you can be a mother and still not have biological children? So I want to say to every woman in the house today, you are not exempt from motherhood. Joshua Judges, if you'd go there, chapter 5, start at verse number uh, 1. Let's begin there. Here's what it says. On that day, Deborah and Barak, son of Abinoan, sang this song. When the princes in Israel take the lead, and when the people willingly offer themselves, praise the Lord. Hear this, you kings. Listen, you rulers. I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will praise the Lord, the God of Israel, in song. When you, Lord, went out from Seir, when you marched from the land of Edom, the earth shook, the heavens poured, the clouds poured down water. The mountains quaked before the Lord, the one of Sinai, before the Lord, the God of Israel. Now watch what happens in verse 6. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anoth, in the days of Jael, the highways were abandoned. Jael was a woman who put a tent peg, by the way, in a king's head. Travelers took to winding paths. Villagers, I'm telling you, there was no weak women there, huh? 
Villagers in Israel would not fight. They held back until I, Deborah, arose, until I arose, a mother in Israel. I believe the Lord is looking for mothers in Israel today. And I'm telling you, I'm not talking about necessarily biological ones. I'm talking spiritual ones who will rise up in this day and hour and say, I will be used of the Lord to accomplish His purposes in this day and in this hour. And the enemies that would come against the hosts of the Lord, I will stand my ground on behalf of the King and his kingdom. Is there any ladies like that in the house today? Then it says this, and God chose new leaders and the war came to the city gates, but not a shield or spear was seen among the 40,000 in Israel. My heart is with Israel's princes, with the willing volunteers among the people. Praise the Lord. As I said again, the reason is the tent peg was put through Caesarea's temple. Therefore, there was no need for battle because what happened is the opposing battle heard the news that their leader was dead. They turned and ran in tuck tail and got out of there. Do you know that the prayers of moms and grandmas and women of God have turned the forces of hell and darkness back in many, many states, nations, worlds, and in young people's lives? Can you say amen to that? I'm telling you, ladies, God's raising you up in this day and hour to be mothers in Israel, to turn the tide, to say we will take our stand for our immediate families, our extended families. I mean, you know, an extended family is when your kids get married. Their immediate family is you. The extended family is the family that they are a part of and that you're joining with, that we're taking a stand for all of the people that are related to us in some capacity. You who ride on white donkeys, sitting on your saddle blankets, and you who walk the road, consider the voice of the singers at the watering places. They recite the victories of the Lord. They recite the victories of the Lord. They recite the victories of the Lord, the victories of the villagers in Israel. Then the people of the Lord went down to the city gates, wake up. Wake up, Deborah. Wake up, wake up. Break out in song. Arise, Barak. Take your captive son of Abinoam. So they began to declare the praises. There was something about my mom as a kid. I can remember as a kid, she would sing jingles all the time. So I'm guilty of the very same thing. When I'm walking around the house, when I'm doing things, all of a sudden I'll break into a goofy song, one that I've made up. It's my own tune. <laughs> She would do it often. She'd break into her own tune, her own melody line. She'd be saying, Ned Pepper, Ned Pepper, Ned Pepper, some kind of crazy thing like that. And you'll hear me going down the road in my car doing the very same thing. So if you see me and I'm driving, I'm either jamming out to what's on the radio or I'm singing my own tune. I'm making it up as we go. I'm sure it's pretty annoying to my family sometimes, but it's what they're stuck with. <laughs> Deborah was a mother in Israel and a prototype of all women of influence. Number two, let's talk about mother-in-laws. Is there any mother-in-laws in the house today? The mother of a per the mother-in-law is the mother of a person, or a husband, or wife. A classic example is the beloved mother is Naomi, the, the, the mother-in-law of Ruth. Let's go to Ruth. So what page is that on? Okay. Go to Ruth, go to chapter 1, if you would, please. 240, is that right? That's awesome. Mine's on 250. Joshua judges Ruth, not far from where we just were. Take a look, if you would, beginning at verse number 1. In the days when judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Milon and Kilion, and they were Ephraimites from Bethlehem and Judah. And they, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah, the other Ruth. And they both lived there about ten years. Both Milon and Kelon also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. I mean, you know, that's not a good thing. It's a lot of tragedy. So they pass away. There comes a time when there's a famine now in the land of Moab, but they hear back in Israel that God's blessing. And so they get ready to go back and say, Naomi invites her two daughter-in-laws to go with her. One bails out, which is Ophrah. And then it says in verse 15, same chapter, chapter 1, verse 15. And it says this, 
Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, I love this. Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. And when Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. And so the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem, where they arrived at Bethlehem. The whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Now go back to the chapter 4, same book of Ruth. Go to chapter 4. Story goes like this. We all know about Boaz, kinsman, redeemer, how God puts that all together. Naomi's a matchmaker. She puts this together. She's the mother-in-law. And then take a look, if you would, please, at verse number 13 of the book of Ruth. Ruth chapter 4, verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And when he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The woman said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He'll renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than any seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms. This is the mother-in-law now, the child of Ruth and Boaz. Took the child in her arms and cared for him like her own. And the woman living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. You say, well, why is that significance? Because look at the genealogy, verse 18. This then is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amminadab, Amminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Solomon, Solomon the father of Boaz, Boaz the father of Obed, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David. And as you run the genealogy, it goes all the way to Jesus Christ. Christ, Amen. that the genealogy comes through the line. You say, why is that significant? Because as a mother-in-law, she stood there. She had lost her husband. She lost both, both of her boys. But this became like her own son. In fact, they declared, it's like a son to you. Can I tell you something? Sonship and daughtership is more than biological. There is spiritual sons and daughters. One thing that God is looking for in the day in which we live is that women of God who are now mature in the things of God, as they've matured, that they are bearing daughters and sons in the Lord and that they're training them and teaching them in the things of the Most High God. Now, Helen's mother's here today. This is Agnes on the second row. That's Helen's mom. I met her, as I said, 40 years ago. In fact, what happened, it was on Helen's birthday. Helen's birthday is on April 5th. She had come to celebrate it. And I remember she'd come from Spokane. And Helen invited some friends. And her and I were getting very friendly in those days. And a couple others. And we decided we're going to go to the coast. So we drove to the coast. We got there. And we jumped out up at Devil's Elbow, his seat ahead. I remember, Granny, you walked all the way up to the, uh, to the lighthouse in those days. I mean, then we walked over the next edge. And it was kind of crazy up there. And I'm going, man, Helen's mom, is she going to make this up here? And she was pretty spry in those days. And so uh, anyway, we walked all the way back down and then we drive back to Eugene and Helen's, you know, when you, when it's your birthday, you get what you want. Did you know that? Right. You get to eat what you want and you get to go where you want to eat yep. or it should be that way. So that's the way it is at our house. So Helen, because she was the birthday girl, there was her, Julie, her friend, Julie, and me and my buddy Quisada. And so it's the fearsome foursome and her mom who was driving the car and doing a very good job at it. And so we got back to Eugene, went to Mozzie's. Anybody know where Mozzie's is? I'm telling you, it's our favorite pizza place in the whole town. And so we went to Mozzie's, and when you're, when you're in college, if you can scrape enough money together between all of you to get a Mozzie's pizza, that's a big deal. That's huge. Yeah, you're going to dig change out wherever to find it. And speaking of my buddy Quizzy, he had gone there once on a mission to get a pizza. And he had got his pizza, and he was getting ready to turn and leave and go out the door. And what happened is the, the, the flap that held the pizza in went open. As he turned, the pizza went right out on the floor, pff, hit the deck. He was heartbroken. He looked down at it. He almost wanted, I could tell, he says, I almost wanted to cry. My pizza's on the floor. It took so long to get the money together, to get this pizza together, that I wanted to cry. He says, they felt so bad for me. They made me a whole nother pizza. Oh. That was very nice. So we go there, and we sit down, and we have a table for five, and we're eating, and it's Helen's birthday, and the big Canadian bacon comes out and all the stuff afterwards, and I'm sitting there. I'm 18. I have no money. I'm barely in college. We're paying our way through college, and I'm sitting there thinking, how are we going to pay for this meal? 
So finally, you know me, I'm kind of like the Peter guy. I go, uh, Quizzy, how are we paying for this? You got any money? <laughs> Helen looks at me says, my mom's taking care of it. Or Agnes says, I'm going to take care of it. And so Granny, she was playing and paying for it the whole time anyway because she was going to bless Helen and us college kids. So shh, bailed out on that one. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> But through the years, she's been a great blessing to us. Whenever we've traveled, oftentimes she has come when the boys were little. She'd come from Spokane. She'd take care of them, watch them, and things like that of that nature. And so mother-in-laws are so key. And it's good to get along with your mother-in-law. Did you know that? So we get along. I tell people this all the time. Two times in my life I ever kissed my mom on the lips. Once when I was married and once when I graduated from college. Two times. Doesn't that I didn't love her, but it just wasn't what we did. But when I got introduced to Helen's family, they hug and they kiss. So every time grandma comes, guess what I get? I get a hug and I get a kiss. And it's not on the cheek, it's right on the lips. So I've kissed her, I don't know how many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, right on the smackers, all right? <laughs> And we love each other and we get along. Because I make sure that she gets to see some Westerns while she's with us. I'll tell you that right now. She loves Westerns. We may have seen them all a million times, but she's going to see a Western, bless God. Number three, everybody say grandma. grandma. So there's the grandmothers. Go to the book of 2 Timothy, and there's a typo there. That's my fault, Kay. Should be 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Is it? I knew she'd do it. Let's start at verse 3. It says this, Paul writing to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. I thank God whom I serve, as my ancestors did with a clear conscience, as night and day. I constantly remember you in my prayers, recalling your tears along to see you, so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded, note this, of your sincere faith. It's literally unmasked. He's saying the, the word sincere there literally means to be unmasked. It means that it's like, you know how you, if you wear a mask, it's not true. It's, it's like hypocrites. It's un, 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 unmasked. Your sincere faith. And then he goes on to say, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Can I tell you what? Ancestry is huge. Yep. Uh -huh. The heritage you leave is huge. Thank God for mothers and grandmothers and great-grandmothers that are leaving a heritage to the next generation that they would say with Joshua's old, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So Paul rejoices when he recalls Timothy's faithful grandmother, Lois, the prayers, the witness, and faith of his godly mother and grandmother were central factors in his spiritual development as he was growing up. Reminds me of a little girl. One day she was sitting and watching her mother do the dishes at the kitchen sink. She suddenly noticed that her mother had several conspicuous strands of white hair on her head. She looked at her mother and asked, Why are some of your hairs white, Mom? Her mother replied, Well, every time you do something wrong and make me unhappy, one of my hairs turns white. <laughs> Bing, the light goes on in the little girl. And she thought for a moment, says, then she asked her mother, well, Mama, then how come all of Grandma's hairs are all white? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Two scriptures. I want you to go to the book of 1 Kings. Don't lose this page. I want to come back here. So put a marker in this one of 2 Timothy chapter 1. But go, if you would, please, to the book of 1 Kings chapter 15. 1 Kings 15. And I want you to take a look at verses 9 through 15. I'm going to draw a contrast between two different kinds of grandmothers. Chapter 15, verse number 9. Here's what it says. In the 20th year of Je Jeroboam, son of Israel, Asa became king of Judah. I hear pages turning, so I'll wait just a, a bit more. Again, 1 Kings 15, verse number 9. In the 20th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Asa became king of Judah. And he reigned in Jerusalem 41 years, and his grandmother's name, note this, was Makah, daughter of Abishalom. And Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord as his father had done. He expelled the male shrine prostitutes from the land and got rid of all the idols his ancestors had made. He even deposed his grandmother, Makah, from her position as queen mother. Note this, because she had made a repulsive image for the worship of Asherah. 
Asa cut it down and burned it in the Kidron Valley. Although he did not remove the high places, Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord all his life. He brought into the temple of the Lord the silver and the gold and the articles that he and his father had dedicated. See, here was an influence that was a negative influence, which should have been a good godly influence, was a grandmother who was going not after God, was really going after the devil in a sense because of her idol worship. Then we go back to where we just were a moment ago, if you would please go back to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 5. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am now persuaded lives also in you. So you have three generations, Grandma Lois, Mom Eunice, and now you have son Timothy. Here is a guy who is now following the lordship of Jesus Christ. Why is that? Because he saw something modeled in the lives of those ladies that were close to him. Now, I do believe and thank God for men in the church and strong men in the church. Are you, are you all all right with that? But I also thank God for women who love the Lord, who are also involved in are leading in the church. It's not an either or. It's an end or. It's both. We need both that are serving Jesus Christ in this day and in this hour. As I told you, my mom's mom died when she was six, so I never knew my grandma. In fact, to be honest with you, I've never even seen a picture of my mom's mom. Never. Don't know what she looks like. Don't know anything about her other than what my mom has told me. Never seen a picture or anything like that. Now, my dad's mom, I really only saw her that I can recall a couple of times. I have a picture when I was a little kid. We had gone to San Antonio, Texas on a road trip. My aunt lived there. And I have a picture in front of the LMO. And I have, I'm, I'm a little guy. I'm about two years of age. And I'm holding my grandpa and my grandma's hand. Grandpa on one side, grandma on the other. And I'm walking with him in front of the LMO. I don't even remember that other than the picture. That's it. The second time that I can recall my grandmother on my dad's side was I remember going to my grandpa and grandma's house. I was in grade school, I don't know, maybe five, six, seven at the most, if that. And I remember walking out the, down, the, down the sidewalk to go in the front door, and I remember going inside, and in the living room there was a bed set up where my, my grandma was laying there on that bed. Those are the two experiences that I have of my grandmother. That's it. So I bless every one of you that you know your grandmas, you've had interaction with them, and they've been involved in your life. I think about my little grandkids. Man, they got two grandmas that love them, that hug them up, that kiss them, that are always blessing them. That is a blessing. Cherish it and honor it and thank God for it. You see, while, we, while honor is an internal attitude of respect, courtesy, and reverence, it should be accompanied by appropriate attention or even obedience Honor without such action is incomplete. It's simply lip service. That's why Isaiah 29, 13, Isaiah said, you, you worship me with your lips, but your heart's far from me. Did you know that the most creative job in the world involves this? Listen to this. The most creative job in the world involves fashion, decorating, recreation, education, transportation, psychology, romance, cuisine, literature, art, economics, government, pediatrics, geriatrics, entertainment, maintenance, purchasing, law, spirituality, energy, and management. How many of you know anyone who can handle all of those has to be somebody special? That's your mom. Did you know that? That is your mother. That is your grandmother.